Pox on the computer. Pox on PowerPoint. <laughs> Away with all PowerPoint. No. Um, for now. It was a very good one, but I, I have. Um, to get really neuroscientific about it, minds find narrative yummy. <laughs> They, they like yummy, yummy, yummy narrative. They like stories. They like to put things into sequences and have characters in them. So I'm going to give you a little bit of one of those. I happened to meet somebody in Northern California when I was uh, there on, uh, teaching at UC Berkeley as a visiting professor uh, about now 10 years ago. And um, one thing led to another, and it turned out we knew somebody in common. And I said to that person, I said, do you think that they would be interested in a story on ayahuasca tourism? And my collaborator then answered by saying, what's an ayahuasca tourism? It's when foolish people from Europe and Australia and uh, North America, they go down to the upper Amazon in order to have an authentic psychedelic experience with a uh, shaman. And uh, when they could do a perfectly good job in their own backyard. <laughs> and uh, I had written a screenplay uh, based on the letters between William Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg about the plant that forms the basis of the psychedelic brew, ayahuasca. I felt like I couldn't really finish that screenplay with actually, without actually going down to the upper Amazon and experiencing uh, some contact with this plant that they were writing about, which they called yahe, but which in the uh, area that I was lucky enough to visit is called ayahuasca. I had a sense that there was something very deep in psychedelic experience that we were repressing, uh, that this was an aspect of human reality which, because things got rather ungovernable and difficult to deal with in, say, oh, I don't know, 1968, uh, we decided to just do what we often do, you know, when things aren't really going very well. Like, let's just pretend that that didn't happen, right? Let's just pretend that we're not all here because of the, the various experimentations of that generation. Let's just pretend that the internet doesn't come out of the fabulous psychedelic dreams of a whole generation of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. Let's keep pretending that until we can't pretend it anymore. I really thought, though, despite my misgivings and my desire to sort of have a scholarly perspective on what was going on, you know, I wanted to understand the culture of the people that were using ayahuasca, even if that culture were people coming from North America and Europe and Australia. But I still thought that basically what I was doing was going down to the rainforest to first and foremost take a drug or as the contract which I signed with the uh, um, outfit that funded our trip down to South America, I agreed in contractual terms that I would, and I quote, trip balls, unquote. <laughs> I honestly had never heard the phrase before, but instantly understood what it meant when it was used. <laughs> I went down to Peru, a uh, highly scattered, um, incredibly frenetic, uh, ego-driven, highly dissatisfied and deeply sick individual. Uh, I, I, that's, how, how do you think I got there? Um, and uh, I went down and I, be, uh, I met the incredible woman who was leading the ceremony, Norma Pandoro. After drinking the highly noxious, uh, but in some ways delectable beverage, what ensued was the most difficult experience of my life in which someone else did not die. I was with great relief told by the internal Socratic voice that the ayahuasca often presents itself as uh, that I didn't need to do this again, absolutely. And so, <laughs> whew, yeah, all right, good. Norma said to me, she said in Spanish, she said, tonight you will again drink ayahuasca. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and she said, oh, no, you must be brave, you know. And I said, I'm not brave. You know, I haven't slept in three days. It took me forever to get ha down here. I just need to sleep. And she said, OK. You know, you know I'll, I'll prepare some capsules for you in my lab back at the University of Peru to help you to deal with the rest of your asthma. <laughs> huh? <laughs> I had not discussed any of this with her. right? I, I, um, and of course, I was probably wheezing up a storm as I sat there meditating. And so I slept. And, and two days later, I decided, and I went to her, and I said, look, you know, in her telefunken, German soccer jersey. Uh, the, I said, you know, I said, look, you know, I'll drink ayahuasca again tonight. I, I want to deal with my asthma. The ceremony uh, ensued later that night, and uh, I drank the ayahuasca. And almost immediately, a wand-wielding bird deity did something to the neurochemical structure in my brain and presented itself before me with a wand. And it started passing its wand over uh, my body. 
and instructing me how to breathe. Now, please know that I'm making absolutely no claims for the ontological reality of this wand-wielding bird deity, but dang, was it convincing. And one thing led to another, and he finally said, look, you know, can you write and speak about the fact that you are healed of your lifelong asthma using an ancient Indian technology? I said, sure, yeah. He's like, now for some joy, right? <laughs> So, message delivered. <laughs>